Well, good morning, folks. I am up late. I slept good last night. Had dinner with friends, talked too much, ate Mexican junk food. That's pretty much what it was, which weighs you down. And at first, I had a rough time sleeping. Whew. Forgive me. But I slept deeply. The dog had to wake me up. The sun was up. So I'm way late. I can't wait to check my blood pressure. I'm hoping it's down. I had a series of dreams last night. I can't remember them very well. One of them let me know that I helped somebody escape from something by taking a large bottle of medicine and putting where it didn't belong. And as a result, I had to leave town and help them. I don't know. I didn't know what to make of it. It just just doesn't quite gel in my mind. Then I had a bunch of other dreams of attending conferences. And the people who were holding conferences later were being mocked because of the nature, the, uh, the marketing nature of the conference. In other words, it was more to uh, sell something that was to convey knowledge. Now, I had a good time talking last night. I talked too much. I kept trying to stop talking. My buddy, my friend, kept me going. I was doing what I always do. I was dumping information. And uh, I guess what I was saying was a little on the profound side. Well, it was. A little bit was shocking me. And don't ask me to recall what I talked about then. But last night, early this morning, in my dreams and sleep and my processing... I was listening to my my flow, my self-speech, my internalized dialogue. You know, when we learn how to talk, we start by externalizing everything. As little children, we talk nonstop, drives mother nuts. And then, and somewhere around the age of two, two and a half, we start to internalize it bit by bit. We don't say it, we don't utter it. So while we've been doing this pressure not talk, everything on our mind is coming out of our mouths. We, it drives mom nuts, remember that. Gradually, we stop a little bit, and we internalize it. And we start thinking internally. This is how we get a stream of consciousness. This is how we learn to think. At least, I think so. And so does Alexandria Alexandria Luria, the great neuropsychologist, the Russian great neuropsychologist, who got most of his, he learned most everything on his feet as well. World War I, I believe it was, he dealt in brain injuries. He came up with some marvelous, marvelous concepts. So the Russian scientists are just, I mean, they've, they've really made major contributions. Uh, you want to know where the... Uh, the idea that the ice age begins with a uh, nova of the sun. Yes, our own sun does that periodically every 12,068 years. From what I can tell, I could be wrong. I haven't been here long enough to, you know, tell you myself. I haven't seen one yet. So, uh, I might get to see one if I live long enough. Uh, according to one Jewish man and his friends who read the Bible and study other things, they're saying that, um, and other people were... We're looking at 2046 will be the uh, end of the 12,068-year cycle and the sun might micronova in that fall in particular. It corresponds somehow with the date, with the timing and the cycle of the flood of Noah. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, well, you're not tuned into this channel of, without knowing about the flood of Noah. There's no way. We get a flow of consciousness. We get a, an internal dialogue. And in my internal dialogue in my sleep, I realized what I was doing. I was justifying myself. Not only was, you know, you've heard of that line, I'm justified in Christ, justification. <clears throat> well, here I am justifying myself with my self-speech. Another way to frame that, if you will, another perspective, a better word might be, <clears throat> I'm defensive. I'm defending myself. I'm justifying what I'm doing. I'm, I'm becoming defensive. 
And being defensive is a mark when a man's not being honest or not quite upright. If somebody is being defensive, uh, then they're not, they're not quite learning. They're not quite upright, perhaps. You need to watch out for people that are being defensive. Uh, but when, I get, when you get defensive or I get defensive, we're spilling the beans. We're letting the other party know what's going on. The other way we spill the beans is we we uh, become accu we, we accuse the other party of, of what we are doing. Sometimes we are aware of that, and sometimes we're not. It's considered a defense mechanism to reduce anxiety. It's called projection. So we project upon the other poor son of a bitch what we are doing ourselves. And sometimes we don't know we're doing that, and sometimes we do. Especially if you're a Democrat, you do. <laughs> <clears throat> so whatever you accuse the other person of that you are doing yourself, that is projection. The purpose of it is a defense mechanism to reduce anxiety. Defensiveness, justification. You know, I like the idea of not justifying myself, not being defensive, not having to make excuses. <clears throat> I think that might be another tip, and I will be thinking about this today as far as the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. You know, it's a it's a pretty powerful entity. It's real and exists. And that's what you want to allow to live through you. That's what I want to allow to live through me. Why is that? Well, not only is it a good idea, the outcome's better. The choices are the best choices. Yeah. And the outcomes from doing the best things are always the best. Always good rewards. Might not look like it at the instant moment, but it will be the best. Sometimes there's a price to pay for being honest. Right away. You know, you lose on a deal or you spoil something or other or, you know, it changes things. But usually a couple steps down the road, it's in your benefit. And when you don't know what to do, and that happens to me a lot, I have to remember, am I running my own game in my head? Am I running my own show here? Am I doing this myself out of my spirit, out of my personality, out of the ego of John Kent? Or what? And of course, if I pray and I stay in the scriptures, stay in the Bible, the ghost the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, will visit me and will dwells in me then. It works. It comes out. And then when I have a fork in the road, a decision to make, the best decision will become apparent to me. It's like the waters open up and part. It's like the way is laid out for me. I got the best thing happening right now at the moment. I couldn't ask for any more. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> one of the lessons that Bible study is that the difference between the holy between a ghost and a spirit is <clears throat> a ghost has lived in somebody already, and a spirit hasn't been in another body or something. I'm trying to understand that concept. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful discrimination in thinking. Um, I'm sure it's useful. I, I, I'm learning it slowly, so it's got to have some utility. But I, I lack that ability to apply it just yet. So I'm working on it. So I encourage you. Keep growing, folks. Keep learning. Stay flexible in your mind, in your body, in your backbone in particular. Don't give in to aging. Stay flexible in your thinking. Entertain new thoughts. Diversity in thinking. Brainstorming. It'll help you overcome the prevailing brainwashing. And they got us all brainwashed. <clears throat> I was in Europe. I was supposed to go to Israel. I was supposed to go to the Promised Land. That was part of the reason why I went to study at Gonzaga in Florence. Gonzaga in Florence, Italy. 
I wanted to get out of the country because I didn't like the country and they kept saying America love it or leave it. I figured, man, I better go outside and see if I really, you know, is it really better outside? Do I really dislike this country so much? Yeah, I was a long haired hippie, okay? The hair was long. It was down below my waist. Yeah. It's hard to believe, you know, that I had beautiful hair. It was nice and dark and it was full headed and women were jealous of the head of hair I had. But I did that twice. I grew it out. It took quite a while. The second time, it did not get quite as long as the first time. But And when I cut it off, my parents were disappointed. You know, they ragged on me for years about cutting my hair. And then I, and then I, uh, I, I just finished college. I just returned from Boston. And I was going to go to the Happy Fishing Grounds. I was going to go for King Salmon Fishing. My parents live on the Kenai River in the summers. The fishing was good then. We didn't have limits like we have today. And uh, we don't manage that fishery very well. We have uh, artificially, I can't think of the right word, but we've built up the red salmon runs. And when we did that, we actually have to harvest those fish before they get in the rivers. Otherwise, they, they tear it up and tear each other up and they don't, well, and so we have to fish those things and they got to let the nets down to get them, of course. And then we have what's called incidental king catch. So any kings they catch in the net, since they're not allowed to fish for kings with the nets, as far as I know, don't remember at this point, and they change those rules and regulations all the time. That was called incidental king catch, and that really hurt the king population in the Kenai River. And I think that the people never were given a choice. I think the, the state and the biologists decided they were going to, they knew it was best, they were going to build that river up. It should have been a river dedicated to king salmon and king salmon fishing the preservation of the species. They shouldn't have brought in the smaller, lesser salmon. Yes, red salmon is the best tasting salmon. It's a better eating salmon, you know, but king salmon is, especially on the Kenai River, I mean, I think the biggest king salmon was just under 100 pounds or maybe just over 100 pounds. Uh, 72 pounders were very rare, but they happened. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the limit or, or the, the threshold for getting a uh, record king salmon certified by the state was 60 pounds. That's very rare these days. I never caught one. I caught a 59 pounder. I think I caught two 59 pounders and my 55 pounder was the one that gave me the ride of my life. That son of a bitch and fish was up on the surface jumping like a damn trout. And my dad was there chiding me because I had snagged it. I said, no, dad, no, dad. And I was up there hooting and hollering, and that fish was jumping. King salmon don't jump, boys and girls, unless the water is shallow or something's, well, it's very rare. And this fish was bright silver colored, fresh right out of the ocean. And usually a king salmon, when it's hooked, goes to the bottom and sits and sulks. It makes it hard for you to get them up. But this one was up and jumping, and my dad was getting upset with me because I had this wonderful fish on my line. <laughs> he was jealous of me. <clears throat> and it was hooked properly. 55 pound hen, most beautiful king salmon I ever caught. <sighs> Why do we justify ourselves? Actually, more importantly, do we justify ourselves? Or is that just another trap? Justification. I don't understand the concept. I'm going to be paying more attention to the Bible in the next few days. I want to understand the fine thinking. I told you I started to discover what Paul was talking about, and it turns out Paul was right. And I, I am honest. And I, I just tell you right as it is. I, I never liked him very much. I didn't like his beginnings and his foundations. I certainly didn't like his command of the English language and his failure to punctuate and write proper sentences. Everything was a doggone run-on sentence. One phrase overlapped another phrase. You couldn't separate them out and tease them out. It was like the guy was on LSD or something. Bad acid trip. But it turns out Paul really knew his stuff. 
Paul is actually probably the most mystical out of the apostles. He probably got us closer to the Holy Spirit than the original apostles. So, I'm laying in bed, full of consciousness, I'm justifying myself. The problem with justifying yourself is you can talk yourself into anything. You can justify the most wicked of ideas, the most evil ideas, the most dumb ideas. You can justify those. You can sequence up those thoughts, one to the other, one leads to another. And the next thing you know, you're not quite in la la land. You're really making bad decisions. You're in a bad place. So somehow we have to neutralize that justification and shut off the defensiveness and that line or lines of thinking that get us in trouble, that convince us that the idea we have is good, it's right, and it's proper when it's not. I think that's improper. I think that's an important thing to know. And in case you're wondering, psychology means the study of the soul. Now that you've heard that, you're more educated than the average psychologist because they don't know what it means. <clears throat> what is the soul? Is it separate from the body? Well, that's a great mystery, and I think we've already covered Descartes splitting the splitting the man. That's where dualism began. He wanted to um, publish his books. Uh, dissected human anatomy. He had been robbing graves. He had been using nicotine from the New World to stain the nervous systems up. He had these beautiful color maps, if you will, these plates, these pictures. He made a living selling books. He wanted to sell his books. It was against the law and the Pope to, to do this to a human body. The Pope had spies everywhere. He already knew why Descartes was coming to Rome, to the Vatican to see him. He knew exactly what Descartes was going to be asking for. Yes, boys and girls, the same, same big organization had the spies back then, too. They'd been here a long time. This is not just intergenerational. This is really long term. Descartes wanted permission to dissect the human body from the Pope. He'd already been doing it. The Pope knew it. The Pope probably actually knew. I don't think he had pictures of the pages of the book, but he knew what was in the book. Yeah, their spy network was that good back then. And the Pope said to him, you may have the body, or you may keep the body, so long as you recognize that the seat for the authority of the soul resides in this papacy. That's it. You can have the body, I get the soul. So the Pope generously allowed Descartes to publish his books. Uh, so you and I think and justify ourselves internally and we'll do it externally as well I love listening to the mind of a really intelligent attorney I mean when you listen to one of those fellows that they speak with such precision their thinking is so precise but there is one mind that I find much more intelligent and much nicer, and I recommend you read the writings of the Founding Fathers. Our Founding Fathers thought much clearer than we do. They were brilliant. They had a command of the English language and spoke and wrote with great, great discriminations, great details, very specifically. It is a commanding language. I mean, talk about laws, understanding, and wisdom. And if you don't believe that you aren't 
dumbed down and controlled and maybe even poisoned just a touch here or there with something to slow your nervous system down? You go read the writings of the founders of our nation. And remember, these men quite often didn't have doctorates. I don't no, I don't think our founding fathers had doctorates much. Maybe one or two. There might have been a Juris Doctorate. I don't think there was a medical degree back then. For sure there wasn't a damn MD back then. We were we were better off back then. Anyway. They wrote at such a high level. I cannot write at that level. I have a doctorate. I have five degrees. And I can't write at that level. Do I write well? I can write okay. But not like our founding fathers did. Their understanding was much better than ours. They read the classics. Their educations were quite a bit different. They read the classics in the original languages. Do you and I do that today? Oh, hell no. We don't have time for that. We've got the teachers, the experts and instructors who will tell us everything we need to know. And get it all wrong. <clears throat> And a lot of those fellows back then weren't very well educated in terms of the numbers. You see, today we have grade whatever through 12. <laughs> they didn't have 12 grades back then. They had fields of mastery, subjects. And when you mastered those, they graduated you. You didn't have first grade and second grade and all that, and you didn't have to do time in the gray industrial penitentiary called, penitentiary called a scroll. God, school was boring and dull. You didn't have to be held back. You didn't have to focus on socialization much. You know, they didn't brainwash us much. They allowed us to think freely. They gave us the, the books, the great classics, and they had us go at it. We could think for ourselves. And when a boy, a child, mastered the demand, they, they moved him up. So you could get through the school system in short order. You didn't have to waste your life, your hours, your time there. You could get back out on the playground. You could go back to the fishing hole. You could work on a family farm. You did not have to waste your time in school. They didn't have that kind of authority back then. You know, there's a, there's a little book in, in the Bible called the Book of Revelations. As, as I recall, there's a dragon. It is a red dragon, I believe. And where have we seen that lately? Oh, oh, oh. The symbol. The symbol for that guy, that king, king of of uh King of Babylon. They just they just coronated and you folks missed the show. Why did they put that veil up around the king as he's being coronated? Why did they do that secret little ceremony in public? Cause they didn't want you to see what was really happening. Yeah. What was really happening? Well, I can tell you this. Prince Philip vowed all of his life he would never be coronated on the Bible. And so you and I think, oh, my Lord, he's in the line of David. He's going to get he's going to get coronated on the on the Bible. He's going to get coronated on the pillow of stone. And the symbol of that gentleman as the duke of whatever that little country of Fife to, that he came from that he was given by the queen is a red dragon. So let's go back to Revelations. I believe the red dragon spews out red floods to drown the woman and her child. What are floods? Human beings, humanity. What are they doing today? Flooding our nation. Why are they flooding our nation to kill the woman and her child? Yeah, you, her child, me, her child. So, what's with that, that, that rock? And what's with that passage in Jeremiah? 
where Jeremiah is hauled down by one of the captains against his will. Jeremiah the prophet has already told him, Yahweh has said clearly, cleanly, hey buddy, you go to Egypt, you're going to be buried there. You're going to die there. Yahweh forbid it. The first, and Yahweh was, I mean, Jeremiah was there with the crown princesses, the survivors and heirs to David's throne, Tia Tamir and her little sister, Skota. Scotland? Yeah. Jeremiah escaped, but before leaving, he said something about these stones had to be left there so the king of Babylon could be coronated upon them and he was going to destroy Egypt. Folks, I think that's prophecy. Now, don't get me wrong. I hang out with people that say the Bible's been totally fulfilled. Well, and I don't mind hearing what they got to say because it does enlighten me. It does help me. I mean, it's different. I might not agree with it. You know, I, I might diverge in my thinking. I might think there's another way here, another path. There might be another level of meaning here. But I think we have the king of Babylon today. You want to know the symbol for the nation of Babylon? You go to two Esdras, second book of Esdras in the apocryphal books, or the Deuterocanonical books, or the inner Deuterocanonical, whatever, whatever the Catholics call them. You go to 2 Esdras, which is the Latinized version of the name Ezra. Yeah, the same prophet Ezra that's in the main Bible. Wrote 1 and 2 Ezra in the Apocrypha or whatever the hell the Catholics want to call them. Chapter 11. It's about a three-headed eagle. You need to read that. And by God, on this video, please... If anybody understands the wings and the feathers, I want to know. I want to hear it. I understand the heads perfectly. The central head that's been asleep for a long time, the big head, is the Vatican in Rome. Then we have two lesser heads that have been very active, very active. And I'm going to guess that on the right side, is Washington District of Columbia, which is not part of America. It's a foreign entity, separate to itself. That's how they rule over us. They got us, they got us all mesmerized. It's a bunch of frauds. And the other head on the left side is the city of London. Not London itself, the whole big metropolitan area, but the little city that's like a mile, mile and a half, depending on how you measure it, which way you measure the city, inside of London, called the City of London, which is, again, a separate jurisdiction. And even the queen has to get permission before she enters it. She has to curtsy before she enters the City of London. Of course, the queen is dead now, and we've got a king. And that used to be the throne of David. And those people on it used to be from the line of David. But they are from Esau. I don't remember when the big trade-off happened, when the usurpation of the throne occurred. But the proper king of England actually resides in Australia. He's a sheep rancher. He's an older gentleman. He's perfectly content being a sheep rancher and with his life in Australia. He is the proper heir to the throne in England. And if you're in England, my advice is you draft his ass as fast as you can to save your country. He'll serve only if drafted. Man, I'm going kind of haywire today. I'm all over the place. I know that. But we're giving you information. I'm dumping information on you. I'm trying to educate you as to justifications, trains of consciousness, defensiveness, psychological terms, the splitting of the soul with the body, you know, the splitting of the baby, the dualism, um, 
Anyway, folks, we're all connected. I'm not sure about the real evil ones, but I need I need to give you this concept. You know, we're not all the same. When you look at what you think is another man, it may not be another man. It could be an angel working for Yahweh, doing his job, an angel in proper standing. Or it could be an angel that's fallen, that's not in proper standing. Could be a man, could be a mix, could be a mix of fallen angel and man. There are no mixes of good angels and good standing in man. That's from Dr. Kent. That just entered my mind and I'm giving it to you. An angel in his proper state does not violate God's laws, does not violate Yahweh's laws. The angels that are fallen that are here among us and been here for a long time violated God's laws. Some of you folks want to call them aliens. Some of you folks want to call them reptilians. Good Lord. What's wrong with calling them what it, they call them in the Bible? So you don't know what you're dealing with. So stop making assumptions that the other son of a bitch is as good as you are, the same as you are. Because you always say, nobody would ever do that. Nobody in their right mind would ever do that. Stop trying to judge him through your ignorance and innocence. I know it's innocence. So you do have the average man and woman. They can sin, okay? So they can do good, they can do bad. They can do either or, they can do both, whatever. But they're not consistently doing evil. They're not consistently doing bad. On the other hand, you've got these other son of a bitches that, uh, that occupy this planet with us and they rule the roost today. They own the earth. They're evil. Stop thinking that there's no such thing as evil. All they do is evil. All they do all day long is think about how to hurt somebody else. And the people that are the dumb ones are actually smarter than we are as well, even though they're not as intelligent. They're always plotting against us. We would like to call them sociopaths, not psychopaths. Psycho means unorganized, disorganized, you know, not in touch with reality. A sociopath is super in touch with reality, more in touch with reality than you or I are. That's how come they're able to predate upon us. They also don't have the law of God etched in their hearts. They don't have a heart of flesh. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They can't have it. Their enteric nervous system isn't wired up to the brain. The vagus nerve, for some reason, doesn't function as well in them. And as a result, they don't get gut feelings. They also are deprived in that they never feel close. They never are loved. They're separate. And they're separate from God and they walk freely among you and I. And you idiots out there are saying, nobody would ever do that. And then you want me to justify how they're doing it and how they got there. No, you aren't putting me in that position. I'm just spitting out the truth to you. I'm just telling you it, it as it is. You can either accept it or reject it. You can swallow it or spit it out. I don't care. But I actually do. That's my problem. I'm a pathological rescuer. It is my pathology. I want to save people. And unfortunately, I even save the people who don't deserve it. We need to step back and let nature take its course. Like a good Alaska natives, when somebody can't start their engine and the poor white guy's waving at us because he wants us to come over and help him get his engine started because he knows we can fix that engine. We wave and smile at him as he drifts down uh -huh, the Kuskokwim River towards, towards the inlet. And you may think, that's cruel and evil. No, it's not. We are not going to deprive that human being of the lesson that the universe wants to teach him. 
We are not going to deprive them of the lesson that Yahweh wants them to learn. We're going to smile and wave. We're not going to go over and help and rescue them. Why? Because if they can't figure out it on their own, they won't ever learn and they'll never be able to. It'll happen again. So we don't rescue them. We leave them up to figure out how to get that engine working on their own. And if they're out there in the water or out there in the bush and they're using an engine of any sort, they have to know how to work on it and have, have to maintain it themselves. They got nobody else to do it. And if you want to know what the best made gear is, you ask a native. You ask the local guy in the village. And they'll tell you, we buy this because it lasts and it works. We don't buy the others. They break. They know. And they are really on survival mode all the time. Because when something breaks up there, it may stay there for two years while they're waiting for parts. <clears throat> I just want you to share this video with those who you know are really going to like it. Do not share it widely. And Dr. Kent is too radical for the average person. If you don't take offense at something I'm saying, then you're not, you don't have a pulse. So yes, I try to stimulate you and get you thinking, and we do diverge our thinking here. We brainstorm, we consider all of the possibilities. So why? So we can make the best choices, and so we can stay in reality, folks. Most of you aren't in reality. Most of you are deluded. Most of you are a little on the psychotic side, believing the bullshit you're being fed all the time. And most of the time, you love what they say. You love smooth things. Read the Bible. Even Isaiah talked about the pastors that lie and something about beer. And, and uh, you love to hear smooth things. You don't want to hear the truth. Well, folks, the truth is really rough at times. And when you hear the other son of a bitch cussing at you, you can bet he's going to be more honest than the guy wearing leather shoes and a suit and saying smooth things. Or the guy up at the pulpit telling you how you're saved because you made a decision. One lousy decision and you're saved. You make decisions every day. The path is really narrow, folks. It's not big box church path. It is really narrow. I'm just discovering it. And I don't have it all right. Not, on, not one of us has it all right. I'm listening to three or four different sources right now. Four sources would be me, I guess. But, and they have different views on salvation. Different views on reality and how to live life. I mean, completely different. And it's my job. <clears throat> it's my job as the man I am, the human being I am, as a member of the Diné, the Navajo, and at the Baskins, and the Micmac, and the Aleutians, <clears throat> and the many varieties of Caucasoid. You guys all think that there's no diversity and we're all the same. We got more diversity than the rest of them have. It's my job to synthesize these things and give it to you to make your life better. I hope that's what I'm doing. I hope that's why you tune in here to my channel. Hope you enjoy my flow of consciousness. Hope you like it. If you don't like it, well, let me know why, if possible. You don't have to. That's your option. Uh, my understanding is that the uh, thumbs down also increase the algorithm. So I'll leave it there. Uh, by the way, you know why we no longer see the thumbs down symbol anymore. Because uh, everybody knew that Biden wasn't in there properly. I mean, he got a record number of votes. A hundred and... No, no, he got 81 million votes. And that that lousy orange man only got 79 million. So Biden kicked Trump's ass by 2 million votes, right? Let me see. How's your math? Mine's not very good after my strokes, okay? That was a long time ago, but still. Nowhere near as strong as what I was before then. It's either 131 
or I think it's more likely 135 million people voted. Do the math, folks. Things don't add up here. May Yahweh rescue our republic. The earth groans for her saviors. Please join us. Please help us to secure the republic, the United States of America, and help the little guy around the planet. We're the only thing in between the evil ones and the little guys around the planet. Don't you know that? Don't you know what your job is? Don't you know what your blessings are? Don't you know this land was prepared for you a long time ago? And the bad guys knew about it too, so they've been working for a long time as well. In the last Earth Age, North America took a hit. It took the hit. It got ravaged, and it was known as the wilderness for a reason. The inhabitants were decimated. It was at that time that your Native Americans arrived after we were here first. Too much information, I know, folks. Good morning to you. May Yahweh bless you. May you bless Yahweh. And I know when my buddy gave me the, uh, you know, the bumper sticker to put on my travel trailer, I said, what? I'm going to go down the road with the audacity to bless God? And I'm thinking, how can this be true? Well, read the Bible. David blessed Yahweh. Yes. Yahweh blesses. May he bless you today.